been talking for the last couple of weeks about Jesus' farewell discourse to his disciples. Now it shifts to a very special moment where Jesus prays not with his disciples, but to God. And you and I are privy to that prayer that Jesus and God share with one another. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorify you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world was created. I have made known your name to those whom you gave me from the world. They are yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf, but not on the world's behalf, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in thy name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. The glory that you have given me I have given to them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. The gospel ends here. Please be seated. Join me in a word of prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. That they may be one, even as we are one, that they may be completely one? Who's Jesus kidding? This is one of the most outlandish claims of the gospel that I have ever heard. So I went and tried to figure out another translation. Maybe it would be better and it was worse. You know what the other translation says? That the goal for all of them is one heart and mind. Now, I don't mean to be irreverent, but is Jesus nuts? You can say a lot of things about the Christian church, but being of one heart and mind is not one of them. There are three, count them, 350,000 Christian churches in the United States, and oneness, <laughs> unity, is not high on the priority list. There's that church in the Midwest who was destroyed by a tornado and they're trying to rebuild. And the church right down the street sitting on a $1 million cemetery fund sent them a check for 50 bucks. There's the Catholic priest at the funeral that I went to not too long ago, who absolutely refused to share the sacrament of Holy Communion with people in the congregation who were not Catholic. There's the Missouri Synod, uh, Missouri Synod pastor who recently told one of our members that they were going to hell because they were a part of the wrong denomination. that they may be one, 
as we are one. There's a council meeting that I went to some years ago, I kid you not. Two and a half hours, we fought. Two and a half hours to try and determine what color to paint the door knob. <laughs> not the door, the knob. There's the fact that if you take this zip code, 30067, and go out 15 miles in each direction, you will come upon 25, count them, 25 ELCA congregations. In eight years, do you want to guess how many times those 25 congregations have gotten together for ministry? Nada, nilch, n nilch, nil, zilch, never. The goal is one heart and mind. It ain't happening. In fact, what's happening is precisely the opposite. In my opinion, the, ch the church of Jesus Christ has never been more divided than they are right now. You remember the time that Jesus took the bread and lifted it up and said, this is my body broken for you? I don't think he had a clue how broken his body, the church, would end up being. Fred Bickner, in a little book, said a couple of verse, a couple of sentences that I want to share with you. If all the competing factions of Christendom were to give as much of themselves to the high calling and holy hope that unites them as they do to the relative inconsequentialities that divide them, the church would more look like the kingdom of God for a change and less like an ungodly mess. that they may be one as we are one. Does that mean we all have to agree? Have to come to some kind of consensus about sexuality and immigration and gun control and the color of the doorknobs? Does it mean that we all have to have to subordinate our deep-seated feelings and passions for the sake of group think, all the while hating ourselves for capitulating? No. That's not what Jesus wants. That's not what it's all about. But I think it is about this. That when we disagree that we spend more time listening to other people's opinions rather than trying to convince them of ours. That we do as Beekner suggests and pay more attention to the holy things that we hold in common rather than the things that divide us. That the relationships we share are of ultimately more value than the differences we have. That as the church of Jesus Christ in the world, when we disagree and we don't get we what we want, it is never appropriate to take our marbles and go home. That we may be one as we all are one is not a trite saying to be laughed at. It's a high and holy calling to be striven for in spite of all those things that tear us apart. Got to tell you one more story. I was on a, an Emmaus weekend. It's the equivalent to the Via de Cristo weekend here in Georgia. And I met up with a kid named Billy. He happened to be about, I don't know, 22 years of age. And during those four days, we really hit it on together. And we got really become pretty good friends. I invited him to worship with us at the church I was serving at the time. One Sunday, he came. 
And after the sermon, I went up to Billy and I said, Billy, it's really great to have you here. I hope you felt welcomed and embraced. We want you to come back. And he said to me, Dave, I really like you and I love your sermon, but I'll never come back. I said, why? He said, he said, Because I don't ever want to be a part of a group that fights more than they care. That they may be one, even as we are one. Did you know that world is filled with billies who are waiting to see whether we will get this right? Right? 